The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. All right, welcome back to 6890. Uh, today we start a series of lectures on satisfiability. Uh, we saw a little bit about satisfiability in the first lecture. Uh, this Now we're going to do it right and do it uh, more intensely and see a lot of examples. Today we'll just see a few examples of using SAT to prove NP completeness or NP hardness. Uh, but for the next lecture or two, we will see many more examples. Um, and SAT is really the most common problem that everyone uses to prove NP hardness. So this is the moment you've all been waiting for, I suppose. <laughs> uh, this is one of the motivations for organizing this whole class is so we can tell you all about SAT. It's many variations, so you get to learn them all and then see lots of different ways you can use SAT to represent your problems. So without further ado, let's get started. Um, today I'm going to give you a whole bunch of problems and definitions, um, and then we will do reductions afterwards. So there's going to be a lot of problems here. You probably will have trouble remembering them all. There's so many. But in particular, the notes serve as a useful reference. Like, here's all the versions you might care about. Here's which ones are hard, which ones are easy. Um, so with that in mind, get ready for the ride. Um, so the original SAT problem is you're given a Boolean formula, formula uh, which is like over the operators and, or, and not. And in case you look at the literature, usually and is uh, the wedge, or is the V, and not is the neg. I don't know the name of that symbol. Um, and it's over n variables. x1, x2, xn. So usually you're not given true or false, although you can construct them by saying x1 and not x1. That's never true, so that's false, for example. Then you can negate that, get true. Um, and the question is, can you set the variables to make the formula true? So that's the general problem. This is the very first problem proved to be MP-complete by uh, Cook and then by Levin. Uh, so it's usually called the Cook-Levin theorem that satisfiability is MP-complete. Um, and I was looking at the paper the other day. It doesn't actually mention the notion of NP in <laughs> that paper. I think that came later. But uh, the notion is there. So. give you another version uh, of the same problem, essentially, uh, called circuit sat. This is a useful perspective, which we will see probably not till next class. But uh, another way to think about it also makes the NP-completeness a little bit more intuitive. OK, this is kind of the algebraic way of thinking about things you have variables, and you write operators, and use parentheses, and that sort of thing. Uh, but if you're more graphically inclined, you could imagine uh, you have your xi's as wires. They're connected to gates. This is an AND gate. Uh, this is an OR gate. This is a negation. Uh, so you can imagine something like this. Um, so you can generally copy your data and do various things. And then this is sort of the output. And so this is what you might call the formula. It is the AND of the negation of the OR of x3 and the AND of x1 and x2. And then pop off, it's also ANDed with this thing again. So the, the one advantage of circuit set is you can reuse complex computations uh, just by copying the signal. Normally, in a formula, you'd have to 
copy and paste that chunk of the formula. So you could imagine this lets you write formulas slightly more efficiently. Uh, I think it doesn't. Uh, you can, <laughs> if you reuse things, you can always use, you can always write them a, as a variable over here. But question. What about feedback? Um, does that feedback is forbidden. So this should be a directed acyclic graph. Yeah, good question. Uh, so it's an acyclic circuit. That would be another problem, which is harder than an NP. So circuit sat is NP complete when it's acyclic, um, and you can convert between one and the other. And it's a little bit more intuitive that you can write arbitrary computations as a circuit. Um, and then this is a question of whether you can, uh, th the existence of some setting of the AIs is the same thing as saying, uh, is there some set of guesses that will lead me to a yes answer? So that is intuitively like NP, and that's roughly how you prove these problems are NP complete. Uh, you write the computation, the checking computation to see whether you, your um, certificate is a valid certificate as a circuit or as a formula. And then uh, the existential quantifiers on the XIs let you do all the guessing to see whether they're, uh, and this is biased, right? It's trying to find a true, and that's exactly what NP does. It's trying to find a true path uh, that ends up answering yes. So yes and true are, are symmetric here. So uh, that's the extent of the complexity theory we'll do today. Um, I'm going to give you more versions of SAT. Next one is CNF SAT. CNF stands for conjunctive normal form. I hope you all know propositional logic, because we're going to be doing a bunch today. Uh, so uh, ands are also called conjunctions. Ors are called disjunctions. This is old terminology. Uh, so conjunctive normal form means that your formula is an and of clauses. What's a clause? Well, a clause is going to be an or of literals. What's a literal? Literal is going to be xi or not xi. So these are variables. So variables are possible literals, and the negations of variables are literals, and that's it. Uh, and that is CNF sat. So it's a special case of sat where your formula, formula happens to have this uh, picture. And in general, you can convert arbitrary formulas into conjunctive normal form. It's a normal form, meaning it's essentially unique. Uh, and a minimal CNF formula is unique. Uh, so there's a known transformation to do that. Polynomial time, that's how you prove this is hard. Um, another view in this picture, we'll use, we'll use CNF set a lot. Uh, usually in even more specialized form. But already uh, one useful view, which we saw uh, a little bit in lecture one, and we'll see it again today, is you can view such an input as a bipartite graph. You have, uh, let's say, variables on the one side and clauses on the other side. And then you have two types of connections. A clause, in general, a clause is going to have degree 3. And uh, I don't know, let's say the dashed edges are negated and the solid edges are not negated. So this is a clause that involves x1 or x2 or not x3. And in general, each of these clauses is going to involve uh, some number of variables over here. I said three, but I haven't actually gotten to three yet. That is three sat. <laughs> so the most common form of CNF sat we use is called three sat, where it's CNF sat in the special case where the clause is an or of three literals. And you can assume it's exactly three or at most three. Um, so that's like saying the degree of each of the clause nodes here is exactly three. And that's the problem that we used for proving Super Mario Brothers was hard in the first lecture. 
Uh, so in my notes, I have things nicely indented. So we have CNF sat, which is a special case of sat, and then 3 sat, which is a special case of CNF sat. A special case of 3 sat that's also hard is called 3 sat-5. I don't know that this is super standard, but I found at least one paper that gives it this, this name. Uh, this says that each variable uh, occurs in less or equal to five uh, clauses, either in its positive or negated form. So this, this is sometimes called max five occurrence three set. Uh, and I think you can even make them exactly five occurrences if you want. Uh, but at most five occurrences is usually what you want. Question? Is that type is like three set four in P? Ah, that's a good question. Three set four. I don't know. Uh, I would guess it's tight, but because there are a lot of people that mention five. <laughs> but I haven't seen a mention that four is polynomial. All right, so we should figure that out. <coughs> Other questions? Or it's probably the same one. <laughs> All right, here's another special case of three set. Monotone three set. Uh, this is where each clause is all positive or all negative. So of course, if every clause is all positive, then you could set all the variables to true, and <laughs> you'll satisfy. If all the clauses are negative, you set all the variables to false, and you satisfy. But if some half the clauses are all positive, half the clauses are all negative, then that's hard. That's called monotone three set. I've actually not seen this used, but I imagine it's helpful in a few situations. Uh, this is definitely the most common. Almost every proof starts with three set. But it's really good to know all the extra things you can assume about your three set problem and it'll still be hard. Uh, I have more hard versions, but before we get there, I'm going to tell you about some easy versions. And question. Is monotone 3 sat 5? <laughs> Another good question. Monotone 3 sat 5, is that MP complete? I don't know. Um, partly these were done at, at different times. Um, monotone 3 sat is mentioned in Gary and Johnson. It was done in 1978, presumably for a particular hardness proof. Uh, 3 sat 5 is probably a very old idea. Probably this idea of reducing occurrences goes to some logic thing. But the earliest reference I found was 1998. And most people have forgotten about monotone 3 sat by then. So it probably just hasn't been considered, but it might be easy. Yeah. It, um, <laughs> Okay, conjecture, yes, it's hard. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, so, but stay tuned for a certain answer. Um, so, let me tell you some polynomial time versions of SAT. Uh, the three is tight. If you have the clause being an OR of two literals, but otherwise you're just like 3 sat, or just like CNF sat, I guess, uh, then this is polynomial time. Um, and let me give you a rough sketch why. Um, so if you have an OR of two literals, that's something like x or y. And uh, the little bit of propositional logic you should know is the meaning of, uh, let's say, A implies B. Uh, saying that this should hold is an A and B are either true or false. Uh, this is the same as saying not A or B. Okay, because if A is false, then the implication tells you nothing. If A is true, then it better be the case that B is true. So either A is false, in which case there's, you don't have to worry about something, or A is true, and then B better be true as well. So these are the same, maybe write triple equals for these are equivalent logical statements. Uh, so we can apply that here and say x or y is the same thing as not x implies y, or not y implies x, it's symmetric. But this is now just a, a simple implication. If we ever set x to be false, then y must be true. And every clause can be converted into such an implication. You can build a graph of all such implications. 
and then uh, turns out to solve two set, you can just pick your favorite variable, xi, set it to true, follow all implications, see whether you get a contradiction. If you don't, then the claim is there is a satisfying assignment where xi equals true. So you can try that with xi true, xi false. Uh, one if there's any hope, then one of them should say no contradiction, uh, and then just run with that. And you can prove by induction that won't get stuck. Uh, it won't make any uh, impossible assignments, unless there was no assignment to begin with. Uh, so that's why 2SAT is easy, and one of the situations you should be careful about. On the other hand, uh, max 2SAT is hard. So max 2SAT is you're given a 2SAT formula, you're given a 2CNF formula, and normally we ask for an, uh, an assignment to the variables that satisfies all the clauses, but if you just want to satisfy k of them, uh, so satisfy k of the clauses, so usually you want to maximize k, but let's say for a decision problem, I'll give you k and I want to know can you satisfy k of the clauses, that problem is NP-hard. So that can be useful. If you can only represent two set clauses, but you can somehow get a maximization thing in, then uh, you're golden again. But two set alone is not enough. Uh, there's some other easy to solve versions. This is essentially generalization of two set is horn set. This may be a little bit more surprising first time you see it. Again, it's a special case of CNF set which you can tell by my indentation. <laughs> Each clause has at most one negative literal. Uh, so that means a clause is going to look something like this one negative. Sorry, uh, sorry, horn is the other way around. We will get that problem is also solvable, but the one that's called horn sat is there's at most one positive literal. So that means your formula is going to look something like not x or not y or not z or w. So there's one positive, the rest are all negated. Um, and we can do some more propositional logic. So use De Morgan's theorem. This is the same thing as the negation of the and. Okay, and then we can apply this helpful rule and say this is the same thing as if x and y and z are true, then w better be true. And so you can use essentially the same algorithm. Um, now you're, you, I mean, slightly harder to check if, if all three of these things are true, then this one better be true. But it's always a guarantee, you know this thing must happen. Uh, just like in 2SAT, uh, if x happened to be set to false, then you know y must be true. So you can just follow these implication chains. If you get a contradiction, you know you're in trouble. Um, if you don't get a contradiction, again, you can improve by induction that uh, all will be well. And so you just make sure every time you assign a variable, you don't get a contradiction, and you can satisfy any Horn formula. So that's cool. So I didn't write it on the board, but this is polynomially solvable. Uh, there's a symmetric version, which is called dual horn sat. Uh, so this is the same thing, uh, but at most one negative literal in each clause. And uh, this is also solvable in polynomial time because you can just negate all the variables in your formula, and then when you get an answer, you can negate all the variables again to get the solution to the original problem. So, because you can solve horn sat, you can solve dual horn sat. Cool. One more bad case I'll mention now uh, is DNF sat. You might say, well, why do we make things ands of ors? What about ors of ands? So DNF is disjunctive normal form, meaning the disjunctions are on the outside. So 
So this be a formula is an and of or sorry, the other way. Or of ands of literals. Use some shorthand not to find clauses here because we don't really use this problem because it's polynomial time. Uh, why is it polynomial time? Just evaluate one of the ands. If you, uh, it's true if any one of these is possible. So you can just check for obvious contradictions like xi and not xi. If that happens, then that clause is impossible. Throw it away. If any clause has no internal contradictions, then just satisfy the clause. Okay. <laughs> so it's basically uh, the answer is yes whenever there is a clause. Could be you have the empty formula, no clauses. <laughs> Uh, so writing, you can also write any formula into DNF. It's like an enumeration of all the true uh, possibilities, but it takes exponential time to do so. So it's a funny asymmetry between and and or. That's life. Yeah. I just want to say, um, for Hornsat, um, even if you don't have Hornsat or dual Hornsat, you might have a formula where some renaming, not necessarily all of the literals, but renaming just some of the literals will put it in Hornsat. And that's also in, that's also oh, just formula. negating some of them. Yeah, like for each each time a, a variable occurs, you have to negate all the instances of that variable. Mm -hmm. But these are called renameable Horn formulas, and that's also do it, finding the renaming is linear time. So, okay, so some kind of uh, renameable Horn, and by renaming you just mean negating, right? So, yeah, the the term uh, used in the literature is renameable Horn. So. There exists a negation of, uh, let's say, some subset of the variables x, uh, such that uh, horn. <laughs> OK, that's a very concise version. So you get to choose some of the variables to negate and make it a horn clause. That's also polynomial time. Cool. Thank you. Uh, you might be wondering at this point, how am I, sp I mean, do I have to remember all of these? In some sense, the answer is yes, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> there is actually a dichotomy theorem that will tell you which versions of SAT are polynomial time and which versions are NP-hard, and we'll cover that in one more page. Um, but I'm, well, all of these are involved in the statement of that dichotomy, so not quite all, but most of them. So it's not exactly a shortcut. Uh, I would say a lot of the time, the problem you're working with does not naturally map onto ands and ors. It sort of involves bits of some sort. There's a zero and a one notion, but they may not really correspond to logical notions of true or false. And they may not, the operations you can do on them may not correspond to and or 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 anything nice like that. So um, the next two versions of SAT are in that spirit. So uh, this is usually these days called one and three set, but originally it was called exactly one three set. Uh, so this is going to be a little bit weirder to write down, uh, but like CNF sat, the formula is the and of a bunch of clauses. So that part's the same. But now we're going to make a clause to be um, a relation on three <coughs> variables, which is that uh, exactly one of, uh, let's say, xi, xj, and xk is true. So this means it could be uh, true, false, false. xi is true, but the other two are false. It could be xj is true, the other two are false. Or it could be that xk is true, and the other two are false. But those are the only happy assignments. Question? Is it exactly one of three variables or three literals? Uh, good question. Um, the original statement is it's variables. So that's how I wrote it. This is usually called monotone. These days, it's usually called monotone one and three set. I don't know how usually exactly. 
sometimes it's called all positive one and three set. Uh, so let's say uh, literals equal variables. You could, of course, if you want, uh, consider a more general version where you can have negations, but you don't need to, so why bother? Uh, just that fact is usually forgotten in most proofs. So you'll see in the literature a reduction for one and three set with negations, and they have a negation gadget. It's like, you know, you don't need to have a neg negation gadget, so why not skip it? Uh, but there you go. Now, I'll just mention I'm not a fan of the word monotone here because here we have monotone to mean all positive or all negative. Here we mean it mean all positive. Uh, not ideal reuse of terminology. I think that's why sometimes this is all positive one and three set. Anyway, it's a bit of a mess, but that is the state of the literature. So you get it all. Um, all right. Here's another problem. Monotone, not exactly one three set. I should not add have any suspense here. This is in P. Okay. This is MP complete. This is also MP complete, but not exactly one three set is polynomial. So uh, I think you know what it means. <laughs> uh, a clause specifies that again we take an and of clauses, and we want zero, two, or three of three variables are true. In other words, exactly one of them is false. No, I don't mean that. <laughs> exactly one of them being false <coughs> would be one and three set again, just by negating everything, which we're allowed to do if we want to. Uh, but this is different. This is saying it could be everything's false, or it could be one thing is false, or it could be zero things are false. But uh, yeah, but not two things are false. Okay, this turns out to be polynomial. Um, and do I have a... Oh, there's, there's one funny thing here, which is in, if, this is, if all your clauses look like this, you can set all your variables to false. So <laughs> this is sort of a trivial problem. But to make it more interesting, you can say x1 equals true, just to get you started. So there's no trivial solution then. Uh, and it turns, still turns out this is easy. Because if you think about this long enough, as I did yesterday, um, this will look something like uh, if you have three variables, uh, either they're all false, then fine. Um, or if one of them is true, then you better have another one true. That's a way of saying if there's at least one of them, there better be at least two. That's what we want. This has to be true for all shifts of i, j, k. So for each of i, j, k, if one of them is true, you want to imply the or of the other. And this is the same as not x, i, or x, j, or x, k. Don't need the parentheses, because it's uh, associative commutative. Um, and that is a <coughs> dual horn clause. And that's why this is polynomial. I think I'm confused about the definition. Why can't they just all be true, though? Good question. Let's say uh, x2 is false. I'm not <laughs> I should double check. I don't remember that in the statement of the problem. So uh, We do not allow negations here. Once you allow negations, this trick won't work. But when if these appear all in positive form, then we can convert into the single negative and get dual horn. Question. Uh, are you allowed to mix the 0, 2, and 3s? Or does it have to be all the clauses have to be all clauses look like, all clauses say 0, 2, or 3 of these three variables must be true. You can't have a clause that says 0 of these are true and 2 of these are no, true. No, but if you, have, if you have two of these clauses that give you all those choices, can you make, choose one to be 0 oh, and I then see. have another one be 2 or whatever? For each clause, it's an independent choice whether you have 0, 2, or 3 of the variables true. Yeah. So this or is local to the clause. Other questions? So it's still an and of things that, it's just we have a weirder relation. Instead of just taking the or of, of a bunch of things, which would be saying at least one of them is true, now we allow 0 or 2 or 3 of them to be true. OK. One more version. Then we'll get to 
Well, one and a half more versions. <laughs> then we'll get to the dichotomy theorem. So, next one is not all equal three set. I feel like that's about all I need to write down, uh, other than the fact that it is MP complete. But just in case, what this means is a clause is something like not all equal of three variables again. And uh, this is what I'm defining is going to be the monotone, not all equal three set, which is also hard, where uh, these are variables. Not just literals, so no negations. In monotone, not all equal three set. Uh, again, that the original proof already had monotonicity in there, so there's no work to be done. Uh, cool. So not all equal just means that they're not all the same values. So that means not all true and not all false. So not TTT and not FFF. I really like this version of 3SAT because it's completely symmetric between true and false. I mean, uh, not at the clause level. Every clause has to be satisfied. Those are ended together in the logical level. But the XIs are treated completely symmetrically between true and false. You could just call them red and blue. There's no reason to think one is true, one is false. You just can't have them all be the same color within a clause. Okay, so you can think of it as a problem on hypergraphs, three uniform hypergraphs. You have all these triples of things. You just want them to not all be colored the same. So it means two of one, one of the other. Two trues and one false. Two reds and one blue. Two falses, one true. They're all this, well those are all good cases, and these are the bad cases. Uh, Cool. So, so this is one or two in three set. Uh, yeah, you can think of this exactly one or two in three set if you want to phrase it in this style. Okay, so um, ideally you should remember all of these, but I'll tell you the most important ones are regular three set. That's at least one of each thing is true. Exactly one three set or one in three set where exactly one of the things is true and adding more things breaks it. Uh, and not all equal three set. Those are the three important ones to know from a lower bounds perspective. These others are to like be careful that you don't fall into one of these things that is uh, <coughs> polynomial. Um, so occasionally max two set is the one other that would be useful here. But remember these guys, they're super handy. Because what will happen when you're proving hardness is you, you fool around and you try to find, you build a gadget that has two truth two possible ways to satisfy it. Call one red and one blue, or one true and one false. And then you figure, you try different ways to combine three of them. And you're trying to get, imp you need some other things, but you're trying to get clause gadgets. You're trying to get them to, uh, that when you combine your wires in, th in, when you combine three of wires into a little gadget, you want them to be constrained somehow, that in order to be globally okay, something must hold locally at those three things. And it might end up being a not all equal constraint. It might end up being an exactly one constraint, or it might end up being a three sat constraint uh, with some negations to make it happy. Uh, it should be one of those to be hard. Um, if you fall into something like this, then that's not good. Question. So let's say since this not all equal thing, uh, let's say you have to call it red and blue. What if you add the green? Uh, okay. Then. Would, would there be like, uh, would not all equal three sets be NP hard or would you need like four set or something? Yeah, so what about ternary truth? Um, uh, I, there might be a problem on that in the P set. <laughs> um, but in general, you'd have to go through the work to check what, which problems. I think those are pretty uncommon. Um, so usually what you do is if you have a gadget that can be solved not two ways but like four ways is you call two of them true and two of them false and hope they behave more or less identically. So that's the most common answer practically to what we do. Uh, but certainly it's plausible with three different values. Some of these are going to be hard, but I don't know which ones. Uh, hopefully all of them, but 
you have to be careful. And definitely the next theorem I'm going to talk about, the dichotomy theorem, would get more complicated <laughs> with three colors. Uh, here actually. Nice question. So, let's do Schaefer's dichotomy theorem. This is about which, which versions of SAT are polynomial and which versions are MP complete. With the right setup, they are all MP every problem you can think of is either polynomial or NP complete. There's no things in between. These are called NP intermediate problems. So it's always going to be one extreme or the other as I'm about to set it up. Uh, and thereby this theorem is by Schaefer and in the very same paper he proves not all equal 3 sat and 1 and 3 sat are hard. Those are the original proofs. So it's a great paper. I have looked at it many times. Uh, it's from 1978, so a long time ago. It's still quite readable. So I don't know how many, th all the last problems we've stated have this property, but I'll make it explicit again. That's, uh, your formula is going to be an and of clauses. And now we're going to allow general kinds of clauses. A clause is just going to be any relation on some number of variables. So there won't be any notion of literal here because you can put that in the relation. I'll call this a general clause. It's a relation on some variables. So relation is something I, I give you a set of truth values for those variables and we'll say yes or no. That's valid or it's invalid. You can think of a relation as the set of all assignments, the variables that make it true. But you don't have to specify that, per se. You just sort of know what it is. OK, so I mean, in particular, if this it could be the or of three variables, then we get three set. Or it could be the not all equal constraint on three variables, then it's not all equal <laughs> three set, and so on. Um, OK, we are going to, uh, so the, I guess, sorry, the relation should be given to you as a Boolean formula. So it could be an or, or you can write 1 and 3 sat as a Boolean formula. It's just a little tedious. You could say, well, it could be this, or it could be this, or it could be this. In general, I'm going to assume uh, that they're given to you in CNF form. Sorry, that's redundant. CNF has form in it. <laughs> um, uh, because any formula can be made into CNF. So now CNF is an and of ors. So this is going to be an and of what we might normally call clauses, but we're already in a clause, so I'm going to call this subclauses. Starting to sound like legalese, but uh, that's I made up this word. It's not in the literature. Uh, so in general, your formula is an and of clauses. Each one is just some relation, which we're going to think of as an and of subclauses. Of course, it's really just an and of all the things, but this is trying to be general because um, we're going to have constraints in the clauses in particular. So then, claim is sat uh, on these types of formulas. Ah, so here, here's the difference, I guess. Um, to define the problem, you specify what kind of relations that you allow. So in 3sat, we say, OK, it's an or of three things. In CNF sat, it's an or of k things for any k. In uh, not all equal 3sat, it's not all equal of three things, uh, and so on. So we give that up front. And then the decision problem is, well, uh, I have n variables, and I can combine them with these clauses however I want. Right? So, that's, so we need some kind of infinity. Right? If I gave you a specific problem, then it's not going to be n be hard. Like if, with these 10 variables, that's never going to be interesting. Um, so I give you the notion of what clauses are allowed, what relations are permitted, and then I'm, I want to consider the class of all possible formulas you can build with clauses of that type. So you can think of this as really more of a clause type, like not all equal, just to be precise here. And then we get a version of SAT, and it's going to be polynomial if one of 
four cases happen. At least one. Um, any one of these will make it easy. We have seen almost all of these. So first one is setting all variables true satisfies the formula. Uh, well, not just the formula, but all formulas of this type. So, or all variables false. Uh, satisfies all clauses. Okay, this is a statement over all formulas with this clause type, right? It's a statement about the clause types, and it's one of the issues we were having with not exactly one three set, because there the clause type uh, allowed everything to be false, and it also allowed everything to be true, so it's doubly bad. But of course, if, if you have clauses uh, where this is true for all the, you could allow different types of clauses. You could have not all equal plus one and three set. Uh, that will also be hard, of course. Uh, but if all of your clauses have this property, then of course you just globally set the variables and you're done. Okay. That was the first case. Um. So the next one is that it could be the subclauses are all horn or all dual horn. Uh, so those are two happy cases we saw before. I mean, we can think of the overall problem as an and of uh, the clauses which are ands of subclauses, so if everything is a horn or dual horn thing, then we are happy. And next case is the relations are all uh, 2CNF. So this would be the 2SAT case. If all the relations you're working with are two in 2CNF, then when you add them together, you still have a 2CNF formula, so you can solve it by 2SAT. And so these are all things we've seen. There's one more case we haven't seen. Is there a question? Yeah. Uh, isn't 2SAT just a subcase of the horn and dual horn thing? Because you're always going to have. It's true. 2SAT is a special case of horn. So. I don't think so. Well, that could have one. Yeah. You're going to have one of the two positives and another one or two negatives. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Ah, right, right, right. So I see. So 2CNF. Some of the clauses are going to be horn and some of them are dual horn, I think. So you, it doesn't fall into this because it's not all one or the other. In general, those combinations are bad, but too, too sad is always okay. Good question. Okay, last case. Is some linear algebra. is one other easy case of sat, which doesn't come up very often, so I didn't write it as a separate one. But So imagine equations like this. I take some number of variables, I XOR them together, and I say that should be 0. Or similar thing, I set it equal to 1. Those are what I would call linear equation over Z mod 2, uh, because in Z mod 2, the finite field and two elements, addition becomes XOR, and there's no multiplication here, so because it's a linear system. Um, so we can solve these things because Z2 is a finite field. Uh, we can use Gaussian elimination. If, even if I have a whole bunch of these equations, I can solve them all using Gaussian elimination. So, or determine that they're unsolvable. So that's another easy case for, for SAT to be careful about. Uh, and theorem is, if you have one of these situations, so uh, the, you can't mix these. If you have one clause of this type and another clause of this type, your problem will be NP-hard. Uh, so, in general, we say otherwise 
sat is NP hard. I guess it will actually be NP complete here the way we set it up. Uh, well, assuming the relations are checkable. So these are the only cases. This is an easy case. This is an easy case. This is an easy case. It could be that multiple th of these things are true. Maybe you're 2CNF and you're all horn. That will also be polynomial, <laughs> of course. But if none of these individually hold, then your problem is NP hard. Question. Uh, so how does this generalize for like non-Boolean fields? Like, I'm sure the last one is also still true. Yeah, so we can go back to your question about three colors. And the answer is I don't know. As far as I know, there's no theorem of that type. But there might be one. It's been. Uh, 30 years, so it <laughs> uh, wouldn't be surprising. Certainly, you can s some of these positive results will generalize, uh, but I think even this one would be a little tricky. The max two set doesn't fall in this. Right, so in here, the goal is always to satisfy all of the clauses. It's always the end of all the clauses. You could imagine a max two set like theorem. My guess is most problems will be hard, but uh, as far as I know, there's no such theorem. Yeah. Is there any way to understand this theorem as making a geometric statement about the relation being like com uh, convex in the hypercube or something? Like, is there any sort of convexity property encoded in this? Uh, I don't know. I would guess no. Um, I know there is a more modern take on this that is more algebraic. Uh, so it's more like if you start with these things and you can build up in this way, anything you can build up in this way are the polynomial solvable versions of SAT. Anything you can't build up in this way is, uh, is NP hard. So if you're interested in that, check the Wikipedia page for uh, Schaefer's dichotomy theorem. Uh, but I don't think there's a geometric interpretation. Uh, this one obviously has a geometric interpretation, but I think the others not, would be my guess. Yeah. Um, so does this say something about the complexity of recognizing the clauses if you interpret them as a language? If I give you the formula that specifies the types of clauses, can you determine which of these is yeah. the, whether any of these is the case? Uh, I would guess yes, but I don't know of such a theorem. That's another good question. Wow, so many, so many questions to think about here. Um, it's definitely not explicitly mentioned that I saw in the Schaefer paper, but it's been around for a while, so people may have thought about that more. Uh, it definitely can be a little tricky to check what which things are of this type practically, so uh, be nice if there's an algorithm. Uh, I would say, so again, practically speaking, uh, uh, there was one hardness proof I was trying to generate gadgets uh, computationally. So just enumerate all possible gadgets of a certain size for my problem, and then see what formula they were representing. And then we would take that formula, do a Carnot map, if you've ever done yeah. digital logic stuff, and then sort of get from that you get a sort of nice minimal form, and then we would, uh, usually we could just look at the map and say, oh, uh, that's just equals, or that's not equals, or something. We were hoping for, we were dreaming for one of these things, or three sat, we never got the gadget we wanted. Uh, so I think with like a Carnot map you could do this, but that's exponential time. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I don't know for sure. I should probably check the algebraic view, that might Right. That's a clever Do approach, it. though. Yeah. Computa to do things computationally. It's definitely helpful because, uh, of course, computationally you can only look at small gadgets, but hopefully there is a small gadget and then a nice proof. So why do the hard work of generating them yourself when the computer yeah. could do it for you? It doesn't work for all problems. It needs it, your problems need to be sort of locally isolatable to not worry about the big picture. Other questions? Cool. Um, well, that's all the versions of SAT you need to know. Because <laughs> um, here we have a universality theorem. Um, there are maybe it will be another one or two that we bump into, but these are the, the things you should all know. It's really helpful when doing a proof to not have to worry about which version of 3SAT you even are going to use, and just know that these are all out here so that when you find a gadget that happens to match one of them, you say, oh, well, I meant to do a reduction from not all equal 3SAT. Um, that that's why I wanted to tell you all these, although I know it's a lot to take in all at once. Um, let's do some reductions, finally. NP hardcore time. So uh, the first one, 
I had actually never seen before, um, but it's in Schaefer's paper, so I thought it would be fun to cover. Here's a problem which is NP hard, and we will actually prove this one NP hard. Two colorable perfect matching. Let's say you're given a planar uh, three regular graph, every vertex has degree three. And what you'd like to do is two color the vertices, okay, red and blue. such that every vertex has exactly one neighbor of the same color. OK, so uh, if you look at a vertex and it has three neighbors, then uh, let's say we color this guy red. It should be exactly one neighbor that's red. And so you can think of this edge as being red, and then the red edges will form a perfect matching in the graph. Every, e every vertex will be incident to exactly one edge. So that's the two colorable perfect matching. It's kind of, well, it, mm, sorry. The red edges form a perfect matching on the red nodes, and the black or the white edges, I guess, <laughs> form a perfect matching on the white nodes, black nodes, whatever. Uh, so it's like two perfect matchings, one of each, uh, one in each color class. Uh, so that's a nice problem. You can think of it as SAT in a sense. It's again just a local constraint on the nodes, uh, and so you can think of this as being a clause involving those four guys. Um, I think if I, unless I did something wrong, you can think of it as um, two in four SAT, or a special version of two in four SAT. Because, uh, right? Yeah. So um, this one, if this node, let's say red is true. So what we're saying is if this guy is true, among these four nodes, there should be exactly one other one that is red. On the other hand, if this is black, there should be exactly one of them that is black. And so the other two should be red. So in all cases, it's exactly two and four of them are red. And it's symmetric between red and black, so that seems good. So this is a special case of 2 and 4 sat. So in case you're wondering whether 2 and 4 sat is hard, uh, here it is. And I have a, um, the original reduction by Schaefer here. Um, do I have any notes? No, that would be too easy. So uh, here's a gadget, and here's another gadget, and then they're pasted together. <laughs> so, uh, And I should mention, uh, so Schaefer claims that if you have a planar three regular graph, this problem is hard, but he doesn't prove it. He just proves it for general graphs. So I'm only going to prove it for general graphs. Maybe we can think about the planar three regular case, but not right here. So this will, not, this will just make a graph uh, instance to that problem. So this gadget, this is a K4, on, and we're only distinguishing X, Y, and Z. And it has to form, there's going to be one red edge and one black edge, so maybe like this and like this, or like this or like this. It's going to be a rotation of one of those assignments. So I believe the claim is x, y, and z, just looking at those three vertices, should be not all equal. Okay, if, if two of them are red by symmetry, there's lots of rotational symmetry here, so maybe two of them are red and one is black, then this guy can be set black and you're happy. It's actually forced for that guy to be black. If two of them are black, then, this, then these two must be red. And if all three of these are black, you're toast, because you should have two of each. Uh, and if all three of them are, are red, you're in trouble. So this is a not all equal clause gadget for this problem. So we're going to reduce from not all equal 3 sat to two colorable perfect matching. So we're representing a not all equal clause like this. And now, what we need is to the ability to copy data. Right? So these are three variables that, at the moment, yeah, they can be red or blue. But what we need is that the same xi can appear in multiple clauses, because we have a bipartite graph. So if every variable appeared in only one clause, the problem would be really easy. <laughs> so uh, that's what this gadget does. The claim is this gadget 
copies a value. And this, I think, required, so it says these two guys must have the same color. And so what you do is you just have, for each clause, you have one of these not, for each not all equal clause, you have one of these not all equal gadgets. And then uh, whenever you have two variables that are supposed to be the same thing, here it's x and x, in our terminology xi and xi, then you're just going to connect them with this gadget, and that will force them to be equal. Or over here we have y and y. So here's the r here is not all equal. In our terminology be nae, xxy and yzu. This would represent that formula. Uh, so the thing to check, which I will leave as an exercise, because it seems, uh, at least I couldn't find a clean way to do it, it seems a little bit tedious, that this forces equality between the two ends with uh, not providing any other constraints. So that was a simple proof, one of few simple proofs. Still some cases to check, but yeah. Um, you, wait, you said it was general graphs. They don't have to be. Right, this is general graphs. Um, so you might say, what about planar three regular graphs? Uh, planar, not all equal three set. When this graph is planar, uh, when the bipartite graph is planar, is actually easy to solve, polynomial. So uh, you can't you can't reduce from planar not equal three set because it's easy. Uh, so, but I would guess that in this situation, and we just proved this is a more general problem than not all equal three set. What we would need at this point is a crossover gadget. So that when in this this thing is going to end up with crossings, if there's a gadget that just communicates the information across the crossover without any other constraints, then we can just plug that in and get rid of all crossings. Then we have a planar graph, and that would prove this part. And then the other part is that we have high degree nodes here, and so I'm guessing uh, Schaefer had in mind a gadget that takes a high degree node and splits it up into lots of little lower degree nodes, degree three nodes that simulates the same effect. But I don't know either gadget. But that would be my guess on how to. That's what you. Sh uh, that would be the obvious approach of how to proceed to get that theorem. Yeah. The other gadget is just one B. Split a node into degree three copies connected by uh, that gadget. Okay. Good. One gadget down. Now we just need a crossover. <laughs> um, other questions? All right. Um, I want to talk about two families of problems, proof hardness for two families of problems next. One is uh, called pushing blocks. Um, these come up in lots of different video games. Uh, one of the first, I think, is called Sokoban. Uh, this goes back to 1984, and this is, I believe, the original CGA graphics for Sokoban. Um, and so, so you may have played Sokoban. I think it's in Emacs, and it's all over the place. Tons of implementations uh, on it. You, you are a warehouseman. That is what Sokoban means literally in Japanese. And you have these boxes. They're all one by one boxes. You are one by one. There are some bricks which cannot be moved. Uh, you have some target locations. And your poor job is to move all these boxes into the target locations. Or rather, every target location must be covered by exactly one box. Boxes can overlap each other. You can push a box, but you can only push one at a time because you're not that strong. So you could not, for example, push left here. But in general, your inputs are up, down, left, and right. Uh, up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right. No. Uh, and you, can't, you can only push one block at a time. So if you push a block into a corner, it's never going to move again. So often you have to hit reset. Uh, there's a lot of ways to get stuck, but this is a solvable instance. I think it's level five in the original game. Uh, so this got started a huge family of uh, problems. There are tons of other video games that have pushing blocks problems. This is one in Legend of Zelda Minish Cap, which I think is a Game Boy Advance game. Uh, it's been a while since I played this one. But here is a level where you have, it's, it's uh, in perspective a little bit, but these are, this is really a 2D problem. Everything is one by one, believe me. Um, you have one by one blocks. You're on ice. So if you ever push a block, it will slide off to infinity unless it hits something else, like a block. Um, and your goal is to get a block here. Okay, anyone see how to do it? It's like Wait, can robots. you walk with us? This is a lot like ricochet robots, yeah. Uh, you can walk wherever you want. Uh, th there is no block. So there's lots of free space in this case. So you can push this guy down, and then push it over, and then push it up. It's actually not that hard. At some point I was thinking, well, maybe I should stack up three here so it ends up, but no. It's just uh, three pushes and you're done. Um, 
So, and <laughs> if you watch the YouTube video that's linked from this, you'll see him spend like 30 minutes <laughs> until he finds the right solution. It's in the game, it's frustrating because once you push them off, they disappear and you have to leave and come back. Anyway, um, so out of all these uh, games, we've defined a bunch of models. Here's one aspect of the model. Uh, so we have the fixed blocks, which are in red, the movable blocks, which are in cyan here, and the robot is blue. Everything's one by one. Uh, and in one model, which we call push, when you push a block, it moves one step. <laughs> that's the normal model, and that's like Sokoban. Um, and I'll talk about the two in a second. Uh, in push push, this is like the on ice version. So you're not on ice. You can still kind of move and then kind of counteract physics and just move one step. But the blocks, they'll just fly off until they hit something. So here, this block will fly until it goes there. Um, uh, in push push push, your everything is so slippery that if you hit a block and it hits another block that's movable, they will all just keep going until they hit an immovable block. But you don't slip. Uh, you still don't slip in any of these models. So there is another version where you slip, which has not been considered so much. Uh, the Ricochet Robots has been considered, and that's in that genre. Yeah. Is there a model where the block you you first push stops and transfers its momentum to the other? Block? Oh, cool. Yeah, conservation of momentum. So when you, this one hits, then the next one yeah. goes. That's push probably <laughs> push stop push. push. I would guess that's also hard because this ends up being the same proof. Um, guessing that works, but we would need to check. That's a good. Yeah, the push, push, ricochet, push. Uh -huh. um, okay, one other thing here is the number two. You'll notice only two blocks are moving. And in general, normally here, two is the strength of the robot, meaning you, if they're t up to two in a row, you can push two blocks. But once they're three in a row, you can't push at all. Uh, the idea here is the same thing happens. So they're just too heavy. After you get up to three of them, then they'll stop sliding. Okay, and same with push, push, push. So Sokoban is actually please push one. Sokoban is like push one. Uh, it's a little bit more complicated, as illustrated in this table. <laughs> so, Sokoban is here, and there it's, uh, you can only push one block at a time. There are fixed blocks. And in general, the models that have fixed blocks are highlighted in pink here. Um, this, this slide thing is trying to capture whether it just moves one step or all the way until it uh, can't anymore. That's the max. So there's only a couple of slide versions. I haven't put push, push, push here because that would be the only difference is what max means. Uh, but everything else, you just move one step. Then the, the other issue is what is the goal? I mentioned in Sokoban, you have to uh, f cover every uh, storage space with a box. Um, that is the only problem with that flavor in this list anyway. All the ones that are called push, the goal is just to get the robot to a destination like in Mario or Zelda or something. So that's the difference between Sokoban and Push 1. Well, Push 1F, I suppose, is uh, pushing one thing at a time with fixed blocks. That's identical to Sokoban, except for this issue of what the goal is, either just to get from S to T, to the robot, or to get all the blocks into a particular configuration. Uh, OK. <laughs> Well, there are some other things here. That that's we've talked about push k, uh, push stars when k is infinity. So you can when you push you can, your arbitrary strength, you can push as many blocks in a row as you want. Uh, push push k, push push star. Then uh, we've talked about f. F is when you have fixed blocks. Push one f, push k f, uh, and push star f. And then there's one other variation here that's been considered, which is the x. This is when the path that the robot takes must not cross itself, must not revisit a square. This is a, there are a lot of video games where after you leave a square, that square disappears, like it falls down to, into, into the abyss, and so you're scared. Uh, so to represent those games, uh, there's another reason we did that, uh, but I'll get to that in a moment. There's push KX and push star X. OK, now let's talk about complexity. That's this the right two columns here, the reference and the Complexity. So um, all of these problems are NP hard. Okay, but there's this issue: are they in NP or are they P space complete? Question. Sorry, I missed. Where did you say a fixed block is? A fixed block is a block that cannot be pushed. So it's just like glued to the ground. So this is just whether or not there are some blocks that are fixed. Right. This in this these problems. This is a more general version than this game. 
Here you allow some blocks to be specified as fixed. Here everything is potentially movable. Although if you have more than k in a row, it's like a fixed block. Like if you have a k plus 1 by k plus 1 block, that's fixed effectively. But it, you have a resolution issue that you can't make tiny fixed blocks in this model. And in this model, there are no fixed blocks whatsoever. But here, you can specify some of them are fixed. OK. <laughs> so yeah, a lot of versions. So push star has a boundary, then otherwise you could just. Push star does live in a rectangular box. Yeah, that is the one. Fixed. You could think of that as fixed blocks or not, yeah. If nothing is fixed, then you can just walk off to infinity, p move all the blocks away, and then come back and find your destination. Uh, right, so they're all MP hard. There's a few that are known to be P space complete. Push push with a fixed strength is P space complete. Uh, or with fixed blocks, I think, should also be uh, P space complete. That's not written here. But uh, push push star, all we know is NP hardness. Uh, push KF, where K is at least 2, is known to be P space complete. But push 1F or push 2 without the F are both open. Um, and the reason we were interested in a non-crossing path is that forces the problem to be an NP, because then you know the solution path that has polynomial length. You can visit each square at most once. So uh, the hard part here was to prove that it's still NP hard, even with non-crossing paths. We won't try to prove that today. But so those, we actually have tight bounds of NP complete. And Sokoban, there's a relatively old result, 1998, that it's P-space complete. OK, let's, let's do some reductions. So this first reduction is <coughs> amazingly cool. Uh, this is by Michael Hoffman, 2000. Uh, this is push star with a rectangular box. OK, so you're here. The outlined regions are the blank space. Everything else is filled with a block. But every block is movable. And you can push arbitrarily strongly. So what this is going to be variables. You're going to make some choices here. These are the connections between variables and clauses. This is a bipartite graph encoded in binary in the obvious way. There's variables here, clauses here. There's a hole exactly when that literal appears in that clause. Okay, there's actually two rows per variable, the true and the false. And then uh, there's this gadget here to connect the things. And then these are the clauses where we're going to check that they were all set correctly. So let's go through it. This is the schematic diagram of what I just said. You're going to start here in the variable block, walk through each of the variables. Here's what the variables look like. You have two rows, the xi row and the xi complement row. That's another way to write uh, not xi. And you're going to count how many times does xi appear in any clauses, in a positive form, negative form. That's called ni and ni bar. And you're going to measure out these lengths. You can negate variables to make sure that ni is always bigger than ni bar. So do that. So in this case, ni is this big, ni bar is this big. Measure it out. This is your blank space. And what, what, you're allowed, what we will show you are allowed to do is either move up here and move all the way over to here and then up, or to move here and all the way over and then up. And this star is so that for the one block that's here it could fit. And then you can go over to this x. In general, in these gadgets, the x is your target. x marks the spot right? for the gadget. And then there's a global x, which will be at the end of the clauses. Uh, so what does this do? Well, if you think about this connection block, this is the, the bipartite graph encoded as a matrix. Um, there's the number of blank spaces over here is exactly ni. So this is why in, after you push ni steps or ni bar steps, you have to stop because there are no blank spaces to the right of you. Then the only thing you can do is go up because there are no blank spaces below you. So in general, these gadgets are super tight because above you there's nothing. It's all blocks. And below you and left of you, it's all blocks. There's nothing you can do. You put the next variable gadget here so that that remains true. Immediately to the, in your row and in your columns, you're completely packed. So there's the only choice you have is to do this or to do this. And you will fill the row that you choose. Exactly. OK? So that's the variable that's gadget. What prevents you from choosing both? Uh, you could choose both. Or you could do a little bit of one and then do the other. That's true. Uh, but as we'll see, that only makes your life worse. Yeah, good question. All right, so next we enter the bridge gadget, which is these two pictures, and it looks like this. Uh, this is basically a locking mechanism. So you start here. I'll just tell you what you're supposed to do. Uh, you walk over through this blank space. Uh, then you push all of these things down to here. Uh, so this basically uh, prevents you from going back to where you were. So you push all that down. And then you go over here, 
and you tunnel down. Uh, so I think you're moving these blocks over to here. It's another kind of lock. And then you're pushing this stuff down to here, and then you get there. So when all is said and done, this will be down here, this will be down here, this will be over here. And so when you're in the clause block, again, you have full rows to your left, full columns above you. So there's nothing, you can't go up and you can't go left. That's the purpose of this gadget, is to connect this thing to this thing. If there's a teleporter, it would be much easier. You could just leave these all filled. But we want to get up to here, uh, and then, but make sure this is all filled at the end. So that's the sole purpose of this gadget. OK, now a clause. How do we do a clause again? Um, so you have, there's three spaces here, because this is three sat. You can move down one here, and then move over two. These two blocks go here, and then you can get to the X, or you can go down here and over and get to the X, or you can go here and down over. And this is possible if there's a hole below you. This is possible if there's a hole below you, and this is possible if there's a hole below you. These are aligned with these things. So with exact I didn't quite align them, but these three columns are these three columns. And if one of these is unfilled, you'll be able to get from here to here. If they're all filled, you won't, because it will be full columns all the way down. Uh, so that's a clause gadget, uh, because things were filled when you chose that thing to be, uh, maybe, uh, did I get it backwards? So you're really choosing the, the opposite. Right, you're choosing, you're, the, you're choosing the thing to be not true, uh, and leaving the other one to be as true as possible by not pushing it. So it leaves the holes so that later you can traverse So that's them. why you wouldn't want to choose both. Right. If you chose both, that would be like making them both of them not true, and so you don't get any of the benefits. OK. That's push star. Cool. <laughs> OK. Um, let's do push push one in 3D. This is really easy. Uh, this is almost like the Super Mario Brothers proof. So uh, it's just old drawing style. So, uh, and uh, we've drawn sort of the dual graph. So these paths are little width one tunnels that you can walk down. So you start up here, and you can either push this thing this way or this way. Um, and so you're choosing which way you'll be able to traverse. Either you can go the true way or the false way, uh, the opposite of wherever you push that block. And so that cuts off one of the things. Then that path is going to be connected to all of the clauses that it satisfies that that literal choice satisfies. Then there's this gadget to prevent you from wrapping around to the other side. Whichever one you come down, you will block off the other path. Uh, and then you do that again for next variable, next variable, and so on. At the end of the last variable, you run through all the clauses. So how did the clauses work? Very simple. Um, if any of the literals that satisfy the clause uh, were visible, then you could push this block over. And then later, when you visit the clause, at the end, when you visit the clause and try to traverse it, if there's nothing here, when you push this block down, it will go all the way to the bottom, and you're trapped, never to get to the finish line down here. But if at least one of these was in, then it will, be, it will block this guy. And you can, if that's true for all of the clauses, then you can get to the destination. So these are just uh, clause checking. And uh, that's a very straightforward 3SAT proof. In fact, the previous proof is based on this one. And the next proof is based on this one. And the Nintendo proofs are all based on this one. This is sort of the prototype. Yeah. Do you have the crossover gadget? The so this is 3D, oh, so okay. there's no crossover. <laughs> uh, but in 2D, we want to get a crossover. So here's how we do 2D. And this will work for both push and push one. That, uh, push and push push. Um, the only place we're using push push was this clause gadget. So let's first get rid of that, that aspect. Um, so here's something called a lock, and you're going to have to believe a little bit here. But uh, your goal, let's say, is to get from A to B. And this is what happens if you try to go from A to B uh, directly. There isn't much that you can move. Well, uh, you can maybe move I down, J left, uh, and like this. But uh, yes, you can move. J down, uh, I down, J left, uh, E down, F left, B down, but not C left, because D is in the way. Okay. Uh, but, so you're, you can't get from A to B. But if you visit from U, 
uh, and you push this block out of the way, yeah, then you come back through A, then you can, do, you can do these things, push them all over, and then you have room to push C over, and then A can go all the way down, and you're through. So this unlocks the lock, and, th uh, and then allowing A to B traversal later. And going backwards from V to U would lock it again? No, this is not a reversible gadget, it only works once. You, you can't unlock, once L is down, it's permanently there. Uh, so now we're going to use this in a clause as follows. So here's the lock, and then there's this schematic above it. So we have three possible entries. This is xi or not xj or xk. Um, and we're going to use this gadget to say, well, if you come down the true path from here, you're going to have to push this block down, which prevents you from using the other half of the gadget. So either you move y or you move x, and you can, then you can only, from then on, you can only do west-south traversal or only north to east traversal. So it blocks the other path. So this is because I don't want to come down here, unlock the lock, and then go back on a different path, because that's not something that's necessarily true. So as you come down one of these, you force these gadgets to be in a particular state that will only let you come back the way you came, uh, go back the way you came. And then you can unlock the lock, and then this just connects back. Okay. Then later, when we're checking the clauses, when we come through all the clauses to make sure that they're true, we're going to route those from A to B to A to B to A to B for all the locks. And if they're all unlocked, then we'll be able to traverse them and otherwise not. That's the idea. Okay. Then we have the issue of a crossover if we want to go into 2D. So we have, uh, here is a basic crossover in the push one model or push push one. If we're going to go from north to south, then we will go, okay, we can push this down but we won't be able to go to the east then, okay? And we're not able to go to the west because if we push this block, it gets stuck. So we can go north to south, that's fine. We can also go west to east by symmetry, essentially. Uh, but you can't go from west to north or west to south or any of the other combinations. This works as long as you do one or the other. Uh, if you do, m if once you do west to east, you can't even do north to south. So that's why we call it an X over XOR crossover. It's not what we want, but if we combine things in this way, we get a unidirectional <laughs> crossover. Um, this is one where, I better check my notes, you can do th one of three things. Um, you can do north to south if you want, and then you can do west to east. So you could just do west to east, or you could do north to south, then west to east, or you could just do north to south. Those are all possible here. So when we do north to south, we prevent this particular thing from being traversed, but we unlock this gate, which later when we go west to east will allow us to do it. Uh, so we go here, and then uh, these are called uh, no reverse gadgets. So once you push this block back, you can never go, then this, this gadget becomes untraversable. So you come here, you push this, push that, push that, and now you can never use this gadget again. So it's like a single use thing. So you can come here. If you tried to do that, you would get stuck because this is a lock and it hasn't been unlocked yet. So instead, you've got to go over here, go through this thing, permanently destroy it, and then unlock this gadget, and then you exit. So that was north to south traversal. We unlocked this gate, and we unlocked this gate. So if you're coming west to east, it could be this has been done or not. So going west to east, maybe you haven't visited this gadget, then you can just go through here, block off a later north to, tra north to south traversal. That's okay then come over here and leave. And if you try to go here, nothing happens. Okay? Uh, or it could be this has already been done, north to south, and then when you're coming from the west, this has been unlocked, and so you can open this gate and come through here. Uh, this has already been used, so you can't go that way. So instead you use this one. This has already been unlocked, so you can get through, and then you get out. So with just a little bit of checking, those are the only things you can do. So when we have this diagram, I think I have one here, variables and clauses, and you connect all the variables to all the clauses they're involved in. This is a slide from lecture one, uh, but it's the same outline. Uh, you, can, you know the order in which these crossings happen, because you know I'm going to visit variable i <coughs> before I visit variable <coughs> j greater than i. So. Uh, I know how to order, and these, th each of these paths is really two paths, one and then the other. And so uh, 
I know whether I'm going to do north to south before west to east. If not, I transpose the gadget and exchange uh, north south with west east. And then I don't need that they're both visited. I don't know which ones are going to be visited, but I can do one or the other. Or if I do both, I know one will come before the other. So that kind of crossover gadget is enough for the push one and push push one. And exactly, it's exactly mimicking what we did with Super Mario Brothers. We just had a different variable choice and a different clause and a different crossover gadget. But other than that, it was exactly the same. <laughs> the gadgets were different, but the proof structure was the same. And that's our beginning of three sat reductions. We will do many more next class.